Linda says there's rolls of 300 feet. 300 feet. 212 dollars a roll. So we'll need two rolls. Yeah. So it's worth 500 dollars on the paper. Yeah. Well, that's about what I figured. 500 dollars. I told him the time. Yeah. 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 Lord, and we do thank you for all the hard work that was put in here yesterday, Father. Able bodies, Lord, we can't thank you enough for this. We pray for our country today. We do pray for all the missionaries out in the field and our military, Lord. We do pray for our leaders, Lord, as they need your touch. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Another beautiful day out there today. Amen. Thank you for all who helped yesterday. Some of you probably wanted to, but couldn't. But uh, some of us tried to, but may not have done a very good job. <laughs> but, but, but we got a lot done. Amen. A lot done. It was a blessing. A lot of people came to help. And uh, lots of hands makes the work a little lighter, right? Yeah. And so, uh, so it was good to, have, good to have a lot of people helping there yesterday. And I got a lot of things. A lot of things spruced up and ready to go. And I'm sure tonight we'll be here late decorating and getting things ready and finished and, and all that. So, big week ahead of us. Looking forward to it. I haven't been in a VBS in over a decade. And so, I don't know what we're getting ourselves.
ourselves into, but it's going to be a good time. Amen. And, uh, it's going to be going to be good. So be praying for that. All right, well, let's let's pray and jump right into the lesson here. Lord, we thank you again for this place that we can come together and worship you. Pray, you please help us to do just that this morning. Lord, help us to take uh, what is spoken from your word and take it to our hearts, Lord. And then also, Lord, help us to uh, lift our voices and praise to you, Lord, in the next service. And if there be anybody here today, Lord. In any service, morning, evening, Sunday school, Lord, if there be anybody here today that does not know you as your Savior, pray that today be the day of salvation. Lord, if there be anybody here today that just has a need, I pray you please help us to meet that need through the service this morning. Please let me pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we are on, we're on verse 8. We're on the last verse of Psalm 101 in our little Christianity 101 course here. There's uh, lessons out on the podium if you did not get one yet, uh, but the... Uh, We've worked our way verse by verse through this. It's kind of a guideline of if you, if you want to live the Christian life, King David here has some I wills and I will nots that help us to uh, uh, lay down a good path, lay down a good uh, good starting point for us. And so um, so I hope that you'll uh, hope that you've been paying attention. There's a lot of a lot of good stuff to learn from Psalm 101. We'll start just like we do every week of this study by just reading Psalm 101 through. The Bible says, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. And in this week's verse, I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Uh, uh, most of these... Uh, passages, most of these verses, we've, we've split them in two, or we've split them in three, and we've looked at the different statements, I will, I won't, um, but today we're, we're splitting this verse all up into a bunch of little segments, and kind of going word by word through it, trying to squeeze out every bit we can, next week we'll have some type of a review to go over the whole uh, chapter again, but it starts with, I will, and many of these, many of these verses have started that way, uh, but but today, I want to focus on those two words a little bit. I will. It's a personal responsibility. Uh, taking personal responsibility in your Christian life, in what you will and will not do for the Lord, and what you will and will not do uh, just in your day-to-day -day living. Because often, often, uh, when it comes to our Christian living, we tend to, at times, put the responsibility for our growth on something other than ourselves. You know, if I... This commentary will make me a better Christian. The Sunday school teacher will make me a better Christian. This music will make me a better Christian. And while study and learning and proper choices and all those things are great and they will help us, um, the final decision each day comes down to you and it comes down to me. <coughs> the preacher preaches on prayer, yet he cannot force you to pray. You read a, about the power of prayer. Very good book, E.M. Bound, The Power of Prayer. You read that whole book through twice. And yet, that book can't force you to pray. You sing a sweet hour of prayer. And yet, a song cannot force you to pray. It's, you surround yourselves with these things, and that's good. But, but it still comes down to you making the decision, I am going to pray. All those things help to get us to the point of making that decision, which is, which is really essentially why we have our services the way we do. We have a service where there's a lot of singing and there's specials and there's everything's about the Lord leading into a message that's about the Lord, right. hoping to get everybody into the right mindset to hear about the Lord. Amen. Uh, but no matter what we do, no matter how we prepare, no matter what songs we sing or what conviction we sing them with, we can't force someone to accept the Lord. We can't force someone to uh, make a decision for the Lord, if they're saved, uh, to, to live for the Lord. We can't force that upon anybody but ourselves. We can do everything in our power to make it easy for them to make the right decision, and that's good. We can surround ourselves with Christian things, and that's good, but it still comes down to a personal decision. I will do this. I will not do this. And, and all throughout Psalm 101, it's filled with, with those statements. Uh, 
King David making personal decisions about his personal Christian life. The phrase I will appears over 1,900 times in God's word. At times it's God making a promise, at times it's man. Uh, the question we must ask ourselves as we reach the final verse of Psalm 101 is, will I? Will I? Do you look back at what we've gone over? Will I sing of mercy and judgment? Will I behave myself wisely in a perfect way? Will I walk in my house with a perfect heart? Will I keep from seeing wicked things? Will I hate the work of them that turn aside? Will I? Uh, will those works not cleave to me? Will a forward heart depart from me? Will I refuse to know a, a wicked person? Will I cut off slanderers? Will I not suffer the proud? Will my eyes be upon the faithful of the land? Will I avoid the deceivers and liars? Will I choose today to destroy wickedness from my life? That's the question. We go through all this Psalm 101, we look at all these decisions, and, and we've spent a week on every single verse trying to get you to make the right decision about the verse, but it all comes down to, what am I going to do? Am I going to am I going to agree with the Bible or disagree with the Bible? That's really, essentially, that's the decision everybody has to make every time they read the Bible. Am I going to agree with this or disagree with it? Most times, though, we read it and we, we agree with it in principle, but but our actions and our daily life doesn't necessarily show that we agree with it completely. Uh, that's a good idea for someone else. <laughs> that's a good idea for all those other whores and heathen out there, but I, I think I don't need to worry about that. Uh, but that's, we, we, often, we try not to be that way, though. So I will. That's a, a very, very important two words. And then early. Early. That's the next word we're looking at. That's, that's an important word. Some of us don't like the word early. Uh, this morning, I doubt any of us liked it. After all the time we spent at the church working yesterday, I don't even remember what time my family got home last night. But it just, you know, it just sometimes early is a curse word. <laughs> it's just don't don't get me up early. I want to sleep in. And we've got three little ones, and, and you know that. And, and uh, no matter what time they go to bed, uh, it seems like they are earlier than us <laughs> in what time they want to get up. And so we just we just early sometimes is a bad thing, but. The longer you wait to, to, you know, the verse says, I will early destroy the wicked. The longer you wait to, to do that, if you don't do it early on, when you first see it, when you first realize it, when it first comes into your life, when you first realize that it is a wicked thing, uh, the longer you wait, the more damage the wicked can cause to your spiritual life. Psalm 63.1. Go ahead and turn there. We're, we're in Psalm 101. It's not far. Turn a few pages back in our Bible. This is a very good verse to memorize. Psalm 63, 1. King David again here saying, O God, thou art my God. That's good. That's a personal claim. Saying it, it's not, you're not just God, you're my God. Early will I seek thee. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I like how it continues. It's to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. That's, that's good. It's hard to stop. In <laughs> some of these psalms, it's like, this is the verse I want, but I, I just kind of want to keep going. It's all good. But he says, early will I seek thee. And, and we all know, we've made the comparison before. King David said, I'm going to seek God early. And then one day he slept in and he saw Bathsheba and what happened to seeking God early. And then there are all kinds of problems that came from that. So, so it's important in our lives uh, to seek the Lord early. But here, you know, the Bible says that I will early destroy the wicked. It's not just, you know, you seek the Lord early, that's good. But you also ought to, as soon as wickedness appears, you take care of it. You don't let it fester. You don't let it simmer. Because it's going to cause more damage. The, the, the moment... Each moment the wicked remains is another moment of greater risk for your spiritual well-being. Each moment you do not seek the Lord is a moment that you are at a disadvantage. So why wait? The longer we wait to deal with wickedness, the harder it is to remove from our lives. And consider weeds in a garden. <laughs> we, we put in a garden this year, 100 foot by 50 foot, the big old, biggest garden we've ever done, and we put it in in a year where we're in much transition and have three little ones. So it, it wasn't necessarily the smartest move for us, but we're going to get a lot of produce out of it. And we've already, you know, we've already got the pumpkins growing and the watermelons and all these things. And it's nice to see that. But we got this garden going and we didn't pre-treat the soil. We didn't do anything. We were just trying to keep up with the weeds. 
And if you've ever gardened, you know it's a challenge to keep up with the weeds. Well, then we went on a vacation. We went up north for, for a while, and when we came back, we had weeds taller than our corn. And I didn't even know they got that tall. And, and, and so it's just one of those things where you let, you let wickedness dwell in your life, whether it be your own wickedness or wickedness that is affecting you that you can deal with um, and, do not, and choose not to. It's going to grow, and it's going to spread, and before you know it, what would have been a very simple pulling of a little, little teeny weed, now it's two hands and pulling for all your worth and there's thousands of them and it's just it's just hard it's a lot harder job to remove that wickedness from your life if you let it just fester and grow and and uh, start infecting other areas of your life uh, you, you may you may say uh, and you know you know pornography is a good example of this you may say it doesn't affect me which it does you're just lying to yourself but what about the rest of your family uh, you know you there's people I know that their first introduction to that life, to seeing those things, was because dad didn't log off the computer and they got on the computer and they saw things. And, and now because that wickedness was allowed to remain in that life, it is now spread to the lives of other people in the house. Um, <laughs> I talked to a person one time who, who would often, uh, he, had, he had young children, he had a young, young kid and, and his wife and him and he would often invite in uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and they'd, they'd talk and they'd have a good old time. And, and you know, I, I, more power to you. But but I told him, I said, you're risking your wife and child hearing a bunch of false doctrine uh, by bringing them into your house and discussing what discussing what they believe instead of just telling them what the Bible says and saying goodbye, see you later, like like the Bible tells us to do. So you're putting your family at risk because. You know that you're not going to turn into a Mormon, but you don't know they're not going to turn into a Mormon. And, uh, and so it's one of those things where we need to, or we, as soon as we see a risk, as soon as we see a wickedness, we need to take care of that thing right away so it doesn't spread and so it doesn't become something that's so much harder to deal with later on. Some of you know from personal experience, you know, maybe you had a kid that pushed the line and pushed the boundary and you didn't snip that in the bud and it just became this big, huge thing and, and you look back and you're like, I should have taken care of that way sooner and maybe it would have been easier. Uh, that's, that's the hard thing. We need, to, we need to early destroy the wicked. And then that word destroy, I just went ahead and just pretty much just put the definition of destroy in there. First definition, to demolish, to pull down, to separate the parts of an edifice the union of which is necessary to constitute the thing, as to destroy a house or temple to destroy fortifications. Pretty much taking it brick by brick, taking it apart to where it's nothing. Uh, second definition, to ruin, to annihilate a thing by demolishing or by burning as to destroy a city. Third definition, to ruin, to bring to naught, to annihilate as to destroy a theory or scheme, to destroy a government, to destroy influence. And then lastly, to lay waste, or to make desolate. Now, Today, we do not destroy wicked people. There was a time, there were several times throughout church history where uh, I say the church, what I mean is the Catholic church would go and they would, uh, they would take some of these verses to heart and they would think that they were Israel and, and they'd have to go out and wage war against the infidels and they would go and they'd destroy the wicked, literally, uh, with armies and with fire and, and the Spanish Inquisition, they burned people at the stake and, and the Reformation when people were just trying to get the Bible to the people, they burned them at the stake. And, and there's, there was a lot of things done in the name of God's people destroying wickedness that, that was definitely not done in according to the Bible. In, in the day of Christ, in the day of the church, we're not supposed to go and murder wicked people. We're not supposed to go and cleanse the earth of, of them living. We're supposed to go and give them the gospel so that they're no longer wicked. Uh, that, that's the solution. I know sometimes it you know, feels like, well, maybe we should just drop a bomb and wipe them out and start fresh. And then sometimes that's an appealing idea. You know, you think about times like after 9-11 and different things like that that happen, and it just stirs up these emotions and these angers. And, and we got to remember, you know, as a church, our job is not to go wipe them out. Our job is to go give them the gospel so that we don't have to wipe them out. So we can be brothers and sisters in Christ and have the same goals, the same mind, the same love for the Lord. Instead of just saying, well, it'd be easier to just go shoot them, <laughs> which has proven to not be that easy. We've been at war for, what, 20 years now? Uh, but it just, it's just crazy. Uh, we got to make sure as, as Christians we realize we're not supposed to go destroy people. Uh, we're supposed to go and give them the gospel 
and the gospel will destroy the wickedness in them much, much better than we can. Uh, so we've gotten through a few words here. I will early destroy. <laughs> we're four words in. We're going we're gonna to make it. We're going to, all right. All the wicked of the land. I think it's important that he says all the wicked of the land, no exceptions. When we're cutting out wickedness uh, from our lives and attempt to better serve Christ, we must not simply remove the influence of wicked people in our lives, but also the wickedness within ourselves. Turn to Romans chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 12. Romans chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 12. It, it's easy to look at others and say that's a bad influence, that's wicked, I'm not going to... I'm not going to let that affect me. I'm not going to be around that person. That's good. That's good to see. It's easier to do that sometimes than to look inward and say, ooh, there's some wickedness in this heart that needs to be taken care of. There's some evil tendencies in my life that I need to take care of uh, or I'm going to trip myself up before anybody else has a chance to. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 18, very well-known passage. This is the Apostle Paul explaining in detail to us this, this issue of your own self-wickedness. Uh, now then, it is no more I, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 7, 18. Uh, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That, that right there, that's enough to make somebody mad uh, today, in today's day and age, even church people. They say, no good thing, but, but I did this. But I went to the church yesterday and worked all that. Brother Rod, he got mixed up on, on the announcements and he thought it started at 9 o'clock. So he was here from 9 a.m. to probably 9 p.m. He's here all day working. And so we, we like to see it. We say, yeah, no good thing, but, but, but I do some good things. There's some good in me. That's enough right there just to derail some people. But the Apostle Paul says, for I know that in me... That is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. We, we know so well, uh, some of us uh, would, would admit we know so well, we have every intention of doing good. We have every intention of living pure. We have every intention of getting whatever it is out of our lives, every intention, but we just can't quite figure out how to do it. We just, we just at the end of the day, we realize, man, I did it again. I messed up again, or I forgot to do, to do that again. I forgot to read my Bible again. We just don't really, it just doesn't seem to be in us to, to figure it out. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find that a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing into me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. We, we need to not just worry about destroying the wickedness around us, we need to also worry about destroying the wickedness within us, Amen. to the best of our ability. If the Apostle Paul... Uh, considered himself a wretched sinner that, that was the chief of sinners and that needed to, uh, needed to battle to live for the Lord, then, then we, all, we surely have some things in our lives that we could, we could try to destroy and get out of our lives to the best of our ability so that we can be better used by God. So we need to destroy all the weakness of the land. Um, we can only do this through the help of Christ and the Word of God. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12, if you turn there, um, Hebrews 4, 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints of tomorrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I want you to keep in mind that phrase. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now turn to John chapter 5 and John chapter 12. John 5 and John 12. I'm going to point something out here to you that's pretty important. John chapter 5, John chapter 12. So the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In John 5, 22, we find an important, uh, important verse here. The Bible says, For the Father, capital F, that's God the Father, judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Alright, so, so when we get judged someday, when, when we stand before the Lord, it's Christ that is the judge. God the Father has given that duty, given that job, given that honor to the Son, Jesus Christ.
But notice what Christ himself says about it in John chapter 12 and verse number 48. John 12, well, let's start in verse number 46 for context here. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Christ says here, you know, God the Father gave all judgment to the Son. The Son says, well, I'm not going to judge anybody. The words I've spoken are going to judge them. So Christ may be the judge, but he's judging based upon Amen. the word of God. And so, so it's kind of it's kind of nice. I like open book tests. <laughs> in high school, you know, middle school, college, you don't often get them, but sometimes you get that open book test, and it's like you, you gotta be a fool to fail that test, or just not care about the class, which sometimes. Um, but that's essentially what we have here. God says, "I'm gonna let the the Son take care of judgment." The Son says, "I'm not gonna judge you. The Word of God's gonna judge you." And then God gave us the Word of God. So we have exactly what God is going to use to judge us right in our hands. Uh, it's like having an open book test. It's a good. It's a good thing. So in order, the only way that we can uh, get this wickedness out of our own lives is we must examine our lives through God's word if we wish to truly live for Him. Because what does the Bible say? The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and uh, this is what we're going to be judged by anyway. So we ought to take this. And examine ourselves based on the, the from the viewpoint of the Word of God, not culture, not our church beliefs, not uh, our religious friends, not TV, whatever. Uh, we need to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says. And if the Bible says we're wrong, we need to say, okay, yeah, I'm wrong. Uh, not, well, let me just get a different version of the Bible that doesn't say that I'm wrong. That's the topic for another day. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Just, uh, just to nail, drive home the uh, idea that you know, when the Bible is, says something and we say something else, we're wrong, God's right. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 4. The Bible says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. The Bible tells us in Titus that, that God cannot lie. God is true. The Word of God is true, and what it says about you and me is also true. And sometimes we don't want to admit that. Sometimes we don't want to think that it applies to us, but we read this Bible, and, and conviction sets in, and that is not the time to try and work our way around the truth. It's the time to accept it and say, all right, Lord, clean me out, clean me up. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, I think it was Miss Linda told me that, that the one desk that he had was was filled with cement. Was that hardened cement? In one of the drawers of the desk was filled with cement? I'll bet getting that out wasn't easy. <laughs> I mean, I've worked with cement before, and I've, I've worked with things. Sometimes cleaning something out is not easy, and sometimes you, you cause some stress and damage to the thing that you're trying to clean out. You think about our lives, especially something that's ingrained into us from, from year for years and years and years, you, you may look at somebody who gets saved and after a year of salvation, you wonder why they haven't stopped doing this or why they haven't stopped doing that. It's easy for us who have been saved for most of our lives and, and never dealt with certain things to look at that and say, why aren't they clean yet? When God's trying to get concrete out of, out of a desk drawer. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not just a simple sweeping job. It's not just wiping down the cabinets. It's a scrub job. There's, there's some things in our lives maybe that are ingrained into us that are wicked that we just we just have a hard time letting God clean out. And some things may take a little longer to, for God to get cleaned out. God can do it overnight, but the problem is it's not just up to him. It's up to us, too. Amen. God wants to come in with the heavy-duty spray, and we say, no, 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 no. That might irritate me a little bit. you, you got to come in with the light stuff. Try it with just water. Don't, don't get any soap on me. And then, okay, we'll get the dish soap, but not the, not the barkeep's friend or whatever that stuff is. That stuff will scrape your skin off. <laughs> but eventually, if we allow the Lord, we just come to the altar and say, all right, God, just do whatever you got to do to clean me up. Eventually, he, he can get that stuff out of our lives. But we got we to gotta be willing to let him. So that wickedness, uh, we need to destroy the wickedness uh, that is around us and within us. 
that I may, that's one of those pretty simple uh, phrases, it's just doing X to accomplish Y. All of what's in verse number 8 so far, I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may is just saying, I'm going to do this so that this happens. I'm going to do this to accomplish this. Uh, and then the next phrase is, cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Now, of course, again, we're not talking about actually killing people and, and cleansing and purifying a, a nation or a place. You, know, there's, you look at history and people have done that, tried that, and it's not, it's not good. Uh, but we need to control our sphere of influence. Uh, we may not control who we work with. We, we may not control who serves us at the restaurant. We may not control everything. But there are things that we control who influences us, and we can control that. Uh, how we spend our time, the places we go, the things we watch, we need to be sure to remove all wickedness from every area that we can using God's Word and the guidance of the Holy Ghost. Uh, John 16, 13, right? the Holy Ghost is our guide. He guides us into all truth. Sometimes we don't like the truth that He guides us into because that truth may be you're a wicked sinner, you need to clean up your act. But he will guide us in all the truth. The word of God is what we will be judged by. That will guide us and be the truth for us. And so there, there's a saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Anybody? I don't, I've never tried to lead a horse to water and make him drink. I've barely ever even touched a horse. But um, I assume it's true. I would assume it's also true that, that God's word and the Holy Ghost can lead a man to the truth, but can't force him to accept it. Like I, like I said before, you know, we can we can sing the songs, we can preach the message, we can give the altar call, we can do everything to show truth in a message, and somebody can just sit back there and just la di da, not not listening, not paying attention, and even if they are sitting there thinking, well, this is not for me, this is not important, this is not true, we can do everything possible. God and the Holy Spirit, they can work on people, they can show people this is truth. But people still need to decide for themselves is, am I going to believe it? Am I going to accept it? Am I going to live by it? God doesn't force us to do things. But we can control, to some degree, how we are influenced in the world around us. Right. To some degree, we can control that. And, and so often, I think a lot of Christians, a lot of a lot of Proclaiming Christians, professing Christians, and a lot of truly saved people, I think they hurt themselves daily because they try to make sure they have the right friends, and they try to make sure they go to the right church, and they try to make sure they read the right Bible and sing the right hymns and do all that right, and then they go home and turn on the TV, and they listen to people swearing, and they, they listen to people talking about fornication, and they, and they watch just, just things going on that they wouldn't take part in. But they bring it in through the TV, or, you know, old school, bring it in through the book, the novel. <laughs> and, and so it's like we're polluting ourselves. We, we do a lot in our sphere of influence to make sure that we're clean and that we stay clean, and then we go home and we turn on the dirty book, and we just jump right back in the mud. We've got to stop doing that to ourselves. Right. We've got to stop it. So verse 8, where we are today, the, the final verse of, of Psalm 101 is paramount because all of verses 1 through 7 are put at risk if you don't do verse 8. So let's, let's look at Psalm 101 8 again. It says, I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. This, this reminds me of the concept of simply just making sure I am around and influenced by the right people. And how often have we seen, especially in young people, but all, even in adults, people who come to church, they get fired up about God, they get fired up about being a Christian, they're trying to clean up their act, clean up their life, they're doing good, but they never get rid of that one friend. Or they never get rid of that, that one that job and go get a different job. And whatever it is, there's always that thing that over time just brings them back away from God and back into the world because they refuse to. Uh, to get rid of it. You can do all the verses 1 through 7. You can sing of mercy and judgment. You can, you can do all of those things that were listed, and those are all wonderful things, but if you leave wickedness as an influence in your life, it is going to put you at great risk, no matter what you do leading up to verse 8. If you don't do verse 8, all of that stuff is, is likely to go away at some point. 
I've seen some some young people over the years that they they got all excited. They started doing all these things. They were they were just they were just doing everything they could do to make sure that they were living for the Lord. But they still hung out with this one kid that just like that kid's bad, and it was a church kid. It's like don't <coughs> hang out with that kid. All he cares about is his trucks and girls and all that. That's just not good. When I was younger. Uh, I, I had a couple of friends. I actually had my wife before she was my wife, and another girl from the youth group sat me down and just pretty much told me I was an idiot and I needed to stop hanging out with these other two guys. And they were guys that were in the church and in the youth group and faithful, but they weren't good influences. And so uh, those those two girls, my wife and, and Stephanie, um, they sat me down, told me I was an idiot, and uh, but they were nicer about it. But that's you know. <laughs> It was the nice way for girl, teenage girls to tell teenage boy you're stupid. Um, but they actually they wrote hand wrote me letters to, to explain everything. It, it was great. They they showed an interest in me, and, and I realized they're right. These guys are a terrible influence. Just because they go to church doesn't mean they're a good influence. And and so that was a very good turning point in my life where I decided to change from from following after and hanging out with those guys, and I started following after hanging out with Michelle. And uh, so that worked out really really well for me. Uh, but but you can see where you know as as dedicated to God as I was at that time and as as sure of my my destination of being a, a youth pastor and someday a pastor at that time as I was as much as I was excited about the Lord I could even see at that point you know if I keep following these guys I'm gonna I'm gonna end up away from from the Lord I'm gonna end up away from church I'm gonna end up away from everything and uh, you just you can't allow that to remain we gotta not make the mistake of thinking that just because we're a Christian and we attend church, we can never go back to the world. Colossians 4, Philemon verse 24, and 2 Timothy 4. We're going to look at someone, you might already have an idea of who, but a uh, very important person in our Bible, because he teaches us something very, very important. Philemon, Colossians, and 2 Timothy. Philemon is like a half a page on my Bible. <laughs> and we will start with the Colossians reference, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Very, very simple verse, but it's, the Bible says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Very simple verse. What can we learn from that? Well, let's compare scripture to scripture and see what we learn. This is we're looking at Demas. Philemon, verse 24. The Bible says here, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So we know that this Demas character was with the Apostle Paul. We know that the Apostle Paul referred to him as a fellow laborer with him for the Lord. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4. I know 2 Timothy comes up before Philemon in your Bible, but that's not chronologically uh, how it happens. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, after what has been written in Philemon, and after what has been written in Colossians, we come to 2 Timothy 4.10, and we see Demas again. But here it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cratians unto Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. Um, this man was a believer who served Christ alongside the Apostle Paul. Imagine the things he saw. Imagine the messages he heard. Imagine the experience. I mean, that, that's quite the thing. But yet, that man turned back, not because of the persecution, not because of the other people around him, but because he loved the world. Because he had a desire for the world, even though he was... I would say in church, he was, he was traveling with the Apostle Paul, building churches, and yet he turned back because he did not choose to follow the Lord, he chose the world. So love, of, love of the things of the world is in our nature. It's in our sinful nature. We don't need it to allow any other wicked influences around us to help tip the scale that way. It's already hard enough to just keep ourselves under control. We don't need to allow other wickedness into our lives to, to try and pull us away from God as well. We need to make sure, as the, as King David said in verse uh, verse eight of Psalm one one, I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you for this day. 
Thank you for the chapter that we've been studying, Psalm 101. Thank you for the truths that are contained therein. Lord, so many things that we can and should apply to our lives as Christians. This Lord, it just seems like a just a list, a, a handbook, or a, a Lord, a charge to what we should do and what we should not do in order to live the Christian life. And Lord, I pray please help us to make the right decisions. Lord, help us to make sure that we seek out and, and remove and destroy any wickedness in our own lives. And uh, Lord, help us to make sure that we're not influenced by wickedness on a daily basis, Lord, that we are influenced by righteousness instead, the things that will, things and people that will bring us towards you. Lord, help us to be a righteous influence for others. Lord, I pray please be with us. Uh, help us to accomplish that which we put forth to do in Psalm 101. And uh, Lord, be with the service to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. You are dismissed.